One man. One hundred guests. One thousand drinks. Drinking with Jason. <laughs> As promised, the return of Neil Turrets for Drinking with Jason, episode number 13. What's going on? Dun, dun, dun. I know, the first return guest. You should be very pleased. It's an honor. I, I don't even consider it a return guest as much as a continuation of a conversation we had to cut off in the middle. Yeah, pretty much. But still, I mean, I'll be first return guest when I come back for like number 25 or 28 or 30 or something. That's when, a, you know, that's a, a proper return. So we were just laughing about this before we went on. I went out and got some bourbon, and I got honey, and apparently this is a huge no-no. Ah! <laughs> what is Will? You just, you just flushed your $30 right down the toilet. This it's hilarious. Bourbon should taste like bourbon, not honey-flavored bourbon. It's sacrilege. It's like these idiots who drink the fireball whiskey. Whiskey doesn't need to, be ta to taste like cinnamon. That's something else entirely. It's like drinking rumple mints, which is nobody over the age of 22 should do. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm not too butthurt over it because I don't like whiskey. So I thought that was pretty oh. good. <laughs> oh, poor Jason, who does this little drinking with Jason thing and has to put himself into a corner. Honey, bro, eh, give me that. Actually, it's pretty good. I'm not, I'm not complaining. <laughs> well, uh, well, of course it's good. It's all sugar. <laughs> Shut up. So, I'm, are you drinking, drinking the same thing? I'm drinking time? the same as last time. The great W.L. Weller bourbon, Kentucky bourbon. 12 years, distilled by the Buffalo Trace Distillery, Frankfort, Kentucky. Yeah, well, Jim Beam says, fuck you, we put honey in ours. That's right. <laughs> so before we get into all this movie stuff, which is, I have quite a few questions, uh, just about the whole process. Now. Yes. You said you and wanted you know, to mention... There were a couple things... That well, there were a couple things that I thought of after we hung up last time, which I thought were interesting. I don't know if I mentioned, you said some of my, who are some of the people I'd interviewed. And it occurred to me, I don't know if I mentioned Bob Newhart was one I, 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 I did once I before, but that was, that. yeah, I interviewed Bob Newhart last year and it was one of the best interviews I've ever done, but it was one of those things, best in the sense that it was just a thrill to sit down and talk to this guy. And he's 85 years old and still has his fastball. He's still uproariously funny, which is, you know, not a lot of guys that age. when you get older, you, you start to lose it. But I actually, it had been a long day and I was exhausted at the end of the interview. I kind of rambled. I couldn't figure out a way to ask the final question that I needed to ask. And he was so sharp that he figured out what I was going to ask without me asking it and saved my ass. Um, nice. But it was funny because I was then recently, some, sometime later, I was listening to Mark Maron's podcast, the WTF thing he does. And he interviewed Newhart, and he was talking to Newhart about, you know, his career and still performing and everything. And Newhart still does 20 or 30 dates a year. And Newhart said, and this is like a month or two months after he and I spoke, and he said, well, you know, it's nice. I, I still have my, I feel like I still have my fastball. So it was something that he, that I had said to him that he then, I'm not saying that, oh, nice. I'm not going to take full percent credit, but it was the, one of those <laughs> things partial, where, at least. <laughs> Partial credit, because I mean, how often does a statement like that, does a phrase like that come up? So yeah. I actually felt pretty good about that. The other thing too is, I'm, I think I mentioned that I interviewed Nathan Lane last year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I actually asked him a question, which I thought somebody would have asked him before. And I'm really proud of this. I thought you would appreciate it. Where I, 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 we, we went through the whole conversation. And at the end of it, I said, I have one last question. I said, if Nathan Lane were an address, what would it be like to live there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he said he was he was that was his reaction. He said, "What?" And I said, "Well, if I lived on Nathan Lane, what would it be like?" I said, "It's like if I were what would happen if I fell into the Brad Pitt?" Okay. <laughs> what did he say? And he said I, he was kind of flummoxed and he thought about it. He said, "Um, well, I think that it would be a place where uh it would be sunny all the time and people would really get along and enjoy a good laugh. And I said, okay, great, thank you. And he said, really, that's it? I said, yeah. He said, I'm surprised nobody's ever asked you that before. He said, nobody has ever asked me that before. I don't think uh, I've ever heard that question asked of anyone before. Well, how often do you get a chance to ask somebody like that? Like the, the, the relief pitcher for the Colorado Rockies or for the, the Angels. Uh, he's he's closing for the Angels now. What's it like to live on the Houston Street? Interesting. 
How often does that come up where the guy's last name is actually a can, 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 could possibly be a place? I don't know. You know I thought it would be more I guess it is kind of weird that he's never been asked that. Huh. Right? Yeah, I never thought about that. So, so okay. Uh, the other good story you had was John Goodman. Uh, did you piss off anyone else? No, no, no. I mean, interestingly, I, I started to piss off Nathan Lane, but I walked it back because I said, you know, he, he does um, – I, 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 I asked him about playing flamboyant parts, and he said, I don't, I don't feel like straight actors are asked that question. Um, okay. He said, it's not like I've only done one thing. I do a lot of different stuff. And I, and I walked it back and said, no, I, I mean, I've seen you do all this other stuff, and I – I like your work in this and this and this and really kind of once I straightened it out he backed up like he was ready he got his dander up he was ready to to go at it with me and I kind of made sure he understood that I wasn't that wasn't the the, the, the gist of my question John Goodman was a unique thing I mean that was <laughs> it's still look I'm, clearly clearly two, a year and a half two years later I'm still getting mileage out of that one so you know I look forward to meeting him sometime and say you know I interviewed you once on the phone and you, you I pissed you off so much you swore at me so <laughs> I was just going to ask if it was in person or on the phone, because he's a pretty big dude. He's a big dude. He is uh, – it was on the phone, and I think it would have been easier if we had been face-to-face, -face because it's tougher to blow somebody off and kind of sure. one-word answer someone if they're right in front of you. Sure, absolutely. That's a lot of why I wanted to do the video. It, it Also, it's funny because you think being on video would make people more nervous, but I found – after 10 minutes, they relax a hell of a lot more. So just because it's like we're just having a conversation face-to-face -face almost. We're well, not the also, same room, they look but... at you and they see your stupid face and they figure, I got to go. What are you about, man? <laughs> <laughs> Dude. <laughs> so I wanted to jump into this movie thing um, because I saw, when did Two Ninas come out? 10 years ago now? More years? than that. Oh, geez. Uh, it, it came out, we, we did the, it came out in 2001. Okay. Okay. Not briefly, it hit video and it came out briefly in theaters and then hit video and TV in 2001. Gotcha. Okay. And I wanted to ask kind of how did you, because you had told me last time that you had never done anything before. You'd never even been on a set and then you're writing and directing a movie. Like, how right. the hell did you make that jump? How did you get people to give you money and to act in your shit? I mean, how did they even know you had any idea what you were talking about? Well,. You know, it's interesting. I went to college with Cara Buono, who was a very successful actress who's been working for years and years. And she and I were friends since we were 18. And she played one of the two Ninas. So the, I'm going to shorten this. There's a longer version of the story, but we only have a limited amount of time. So the, the gist of it is, I, as I said last time, I desperately wanted to be a novelist growing up. So I wrote uh, a novel called Two Women Named Nina, which was much darker, uh, was, you know, it was, uh, it was really kind of reflected this place where I was in my, my life. It was the summer of 94, I think, that I wrote it. And I was pretty unhappy. And I wrote about, I was, you know, and I was lonely and kind of just lost. I was in a job I hated. I was drinking too much. And uh, to I, sorry? As compared to now? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I was going through, I was probably going through a couple cases of beer a week. Whew. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Shit. I was going, yeah. I mean, it was, I was, I was probably going through at least a six pack a day. So, and sometimes more. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, I wrote this thing and I had a couple people read it and they thought it was interesting. And Kara read it and said, you know, it's 350 pages of dialogue. This is a film, not a, 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 right. a, a book. So I didn't really know what to do with that. I put it aside, and I, as I mentioned last time, I kind of saw a movie in the summer of 96 and said, ugh, I can do better than this. So I pulled that out of the drawer and figured out how to write a script, and then uh, I met Amanda Pete through a mutual friend. Amanda and I also went to college together. She's a year younger than I am, but we didn't know each other in college. But I, one of her good friends and I were classmates and were friends since the beginning of freshman year. Had she been in anything at this point? Sorry? Had she been in anything at this point? She had. She. I met her actually at the premiere of Ed Burns' second movie. Uh, she's the one. She's, and Amanda that. plays Jennifer Aniston's younger sister in that movie. Okay. So 
Amanda and I met, we hit it off, and at some point I sent her the script, and it took her about a month to read it, and when she finally did, she called me up and said, I love this, I don't care what happens, I don't care who you have to kill, I have to play Nina, Nina Harris. Nina Cohen and Nina Harris, the two Ninas. And so then I had Kara and Amanda, and in talking to them, I had somehow convinced them both that I knew what I was doing with a camera and that I could direct the movie. And through that, um, did you have a demo me, reel or something? I'm sorry, no, did, no, no. But I mean, I had been to look. You know, Quentin Tarantino didn't go to film school. He he likes to say, "I didn't go to film school. I went to films." And I do the same thing. I've been a movie freak my whole life. You and I have had conversations about this, where you know we spend a lot of our time watching movies. Sure. And I f I'm a firm believer in the idea that you don't need to go to film school to be a good filmmaker. You just need to understand what making a film is and how to tell a story. It's Absolutely. just a different I, I, it's, absolutely. It's, I tell people all the time, if you want to be a writer, don't go to college for literature. I mean, or creative writing. That's one of the worst yeah, things you can do. People ask me all the time. They say, were, were you an English major? And I say, no, I was a history major because I knew I wanted to be a writer and I figured I'd study something I enjoy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in the, my, the, Columbia, where I went to college, has a core curriculum. There's a lot of required classes. And I got most of them out of my, my way, the, out of the way my first two years. And my, I had a B minus or a C plus average the first two years. And my last two years, when I was focusing on the stuff that I wanted to study, I had a B plus, A minus average. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, and I ended up, you know, with a, with a solid B. So, it's like, you know, I graduated from a good school with, with a solid 3.0 or 3.1 or whatever it was, like a solid B average, which I'll take. I got a great education. I learned a shit list, And I started to learn how to write, you know. But it's also, it's a process. I'm a much better writer now at the age of 44 than I was at the age of 40. Than I was at the age of 34. Than certainly the what I was at 26. I mean, I can't watch two Nemans now. You sure. know, I mean, there are. I don't know if you've seen it since. If, if you've seen it since we. Not yet. No. Um, anybody who's listening, it's on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you can stream it for free. It's not on. You can get it on Netflix DVD, but it's not streaming on Netflix. But it is streaming on Amazon Prime. Okay. So for free. So there are people, and look, it's one of those films that, that I stand by. It's a good movie. It's certainly a good first film. And as far as romantic comedies go, it gets the job done. You know, I think that, you know, I was doing a and a once, and this guy who was a bit of a blowhard was saying things like, you know, this shot here is a bit of a cliche, and there's this and that. And I, I tried to explain the concept of establishing shots, like there's a shot before two of the characters are in Central Park talking. And instead of actually them saying, instead of having them say, well, here we are in Central Park, you have a shot of Central Park. Right. It establishes, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, we, yeah, and I said, and I explained this, and, and it's a full house, and people are starting to get antsy because he and I are starting to get into it a little bit. And finally, I just said, you know what? I, I was just trying to make a nice little romantic comedy. I wasn't trying to make Citizen Kane. Sure. Which is true. Uh -huh. And the place erupted. Because they were like, yeah, that's what this is. I mean, not every movie has to be the most important movie. Not every movie has to be The Godfather. Not every movie has to be Boyhood. Not every movie has to be um, Pulp Fiction. And not all movies are going to be. Some of them are just going to be fun little jewels that you find. And some are going to be stupid entertainment. And some are going to be horror movies that, you know, that, that I might not like, but others lap up, you know, eat up with a spoon. That's what this is about. I mean, you can't have... I don't, I, I, there, there are a lot of movies I want to make and a lot of, there are some that I think in a perfect world might get consideration for, you know, Oscar stuff, but there's a lot of movies I want to make that wouldn't any, come you anywhere close and don't have any such aspirations. And I think that's fine. You know, there's I mean, the next movie, people. Movie. sorry, there's nothing wrong with entertaining people. That's exactly right. And that's what I was trying to do with two Ninas. And I think that I was, look, I was naive and I was uh unschooled and i had to some extent no idea what i was doing but i was smart enough to recognize that i was able that i had written a good script that i felt like i knew what i was doing when it came to how to tell a story cinematically because of how much time i'd spent watching them on television and the movie theaters and stuff and i was smart enough to hire people who knew what i didn't there are people and I know that you want to talk about that thing with the cat, and we will. The, one of the things that happened there is I dealt with two women who didn't know what they didn't know. And I realized that too late in the game to m properly deal with it. I have always been proud of, especially as a professional, 
and it hasn't always been this way, but most of the time, I know what I don't know, especially now. I'm self-confident enough and have enough uh, self-esteem to admit when I don't know something, and not everyone can do that. Sure. Uh, but I always surround myself with people who are professional, who know what they're doing, and who know a lot more about their job than I do. Mm -hmm. And my job is to trust them to fulfill the vision that I have. And for my my job is is also part, that's part of my job. Part of my job also is to communicate properly because that's as much directing is as much about communication as anything else. Okay. You know, whether it's live action or film, I direct the same way. It's sitting down and making sure that what I have in mind and my vision for the story I want to tell is adequately and properly communicated to the people who I need to help me fulfill that vision. Sure, you know? that makes sense. Okay. And it's the same thing like if I'm directing live action, you know, if I'm directing theater, it's about making sure the actors understand what I'm trying to tell them. And if I can't communicate that with, they don't understand what I'm getting at, then I'm not doing my job. And look, I can talk a good game. So I was able to get people to give me 10,000 here, 10,000 there, 5,000 here. You know, I put a fair amount of my own money into it. Okay, that was going to be my next um, question. How did you get funding without having any kind of background? And Okay, so you just went piecemeal. I think it helped that I had actors ready on board. Okay. You know, I think that I had actors on board and I then found a couple of people who were, you know, and I had fans who people who, I, working at Us Magazine in the 90s, I made a lot of good contacts, one of which was with a publicist named Mara Buxbaum, who is now one of the biggest publicists in Hollywood. She runs her own firm now. She, at the time, worked for a company called PMK, which is now PMK BMH, I think. It's one of the bigger publicity houses in, in, in the business. And Mara and I became friends, and she read the script, and she read several different versions of the script, and her assistant was friends with a woman named Denise Doyle, who worked at Miramax and worked for Harvey Weinstein. The script, Fontaine was the assistant. She gave it to Denise, who read it, loved it. Denise and I hit it off. Denise then brought it in, gave it to a, a guy she used to work with, a guy named Greg Scheinman, and the three of us hit it off and then went off and said, okay, we can do this. So I think the fact that I had actors on board and producers, everybody was naive enough to think, oh, okay, well, let's give this a shot. You know, And it's funny because when I finally showed the movie to my dad, my parents, they watched the movie, it ended, and I showed it, it was Thanksgiving a year later, it was 98. We shot it in October of 97. So at Thanksgiving, I showed it to my, friend, my family and a bunch of other people up in Portland, Maine. And there were about 30 or 40 people sitting there watching. And I kind of said, okay, here you go. And I went out and walked around for an hour, hour and a half and came back as the movie ended. And everybody really liked it. And I said, okay, I really, you know, and, and, and my dad said, I don't want to say I'm surprised because I'm not surprised. I said, you're relieved. He said, I'm relieved. Thank you. He said, that's what, what I was going for. <laughs> I'm relieved. You clearly know how to do this. Sure. You didn't just waste a hundred grand making it. Yeah. Turn. I didn't just waste them. I didn't just waste a bunch of his money and my money and, you know, some, a bunch of other people's money. I mean, as it turns out, nobody ever made their money back because the movie fell through the cracks, but I still have faith that at some point that movie is going to find some traction and people will look back on it and say, you know, this is a really lovely undiscovered gem of 1990s cinema. Because I believe it. I mean, and I don't think too highly of it. I don't think, I'm thinking too highly of myself. I just think that people who see it now say, boy, this is a really lovely movie. How come this didn't break out? And I say, I don't know. Sorry, that's my email. I say, I don't know. It's just one of those things that didn't. Well, yeah, with streaming now, there's a hell of a lot better chance of people finding it. I, for sure. For sure. And um, uh, certainly the fact that I discovered that it was on Amazon Prime, because a lot of most people, I think most people have it. So it's one of those things where I can say, say, where can I see it? Amazon Prime. Oh, I have Amazon Prime. I'll watch it. And it's, you know, it's 90 minutes, so it's an easy watch. I can't yeah. believe you haven't watched it. You're such a prick. Yeah, well, I don't actually like you. I just pretend to. So when we're not say, talking, I'm not looking I was at just you. about to say, that's funny, because I was just about to say, you know, that might be the booze talking, but the truth is I don't really like you, so it can't be. Yeah, see, we're just trying to work together, but it's like an animosity in the working same relationship. Uh, so this was... Same. You said like 2001, and then... The movie, well, we, it took us a few years to sell it. We did the film festival circuit in 99, and then... Now for people who don't know, that means you're taking it to film festivals and showing it, but you have to 
enter it and get accepted, correct? Correct. Right. Okay. We did not get into Sundance, which still baffles me. Uh, although at that time, they still were doing edgier fare. If that movie, if Tuninas came out today, it would be a huge hit because the studios aren't making romantic comedies anymore. And the only people who are are the indies. So okay. Sundance now is taking, Sundance is showing many more romantic comedies in a way they didn't 15, 16, 18 years ago. And that's why actually the next movie I think I might make is a romantic comedy. Uh, something that I wrote, it's kind of a female high fidelity. And I have a producer in LA who's really jazzed about it and we're hopefully moving forward this summer and shoot it in New Orleans some, sometime hopefully before the end of the year. But she and I are of one, one mind about this because it's, you know, there is a market for indie romantic comedies in a way there wasn't before. I was told back in the day, we don't know how to market this because it's a romantic comedy without any stars in it. Because at the time, the studios are making, still making star-driven romantic comedies. But they're not making those movies anymore. So you get a movie like, you get a movie like Jenny, someone like Jenny Slate is in Obvious Child, and, there's, and they shoot it for nothing, and there's no reason why that movie should break out, other than it's a charming little movie. But it was a huge hit. They made it for half a million dollars or so, or $600,000, and it made over $5 million at the box office, and that doesn't even include the VOD numbers. Sure. So that's an enormous fucking hit when it comes on, on a, for a film on that scale. We go off and make this film Rocket Surgery, which is, you know, we make it for a million dollars, and getting that, you know, you cast someone like, I don't know, Rose Byrne or Alison Brie or um, Rashida Jones or somebody who is not a megastar but well-known enough that it's, it, it gets people's attention. You throw a bunch of interesting actors around her. That's a movie that if I don't fuck up the job as, as the director, because it's a solid script, if I don't fuck up as a director, that movie sells. That movie absolutely sells. And that's one of the things we're talking about. It's just the, the business has changed. I know we're well, jumping around a little bit. No, 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 that's kind of fine. Just, I, I wanted to talk about the business side a little more. I was going to get to that thing with the cat first. But I, let's talk about the video on demand thing now. That has changed everything as well. So, like you said, that's not um, counting the video um, on demand um, numbers. Um, what? I unbelievably changed. Sorry, I jumped on you. Sorry, yeah, sorry. son of a bitch. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. how much of a film's take is now coming from video on demand? Like, is there a rough percentage? Is it... I mean, it's, so, like, for a movie like Interstellar, it's probably going to do more in the box office than Video on Demand. But what about, like, a smaller movie? Right. Well, Video on Demand, especially nowadays with these fantastic... With bigger screens, bigger screen TVs, with high-def television, with, you know, people having home theaters, and the rising price of going to the movies... Which is ridiculous. Which is I mean, ridiculous. People have been saying that forever, but it's really bad. But it's now to see a regular movie, not in 3D, not on IMAX, in New York is like 16 bucks. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. But um, with with those bigger movies, that certainly does add. It it, it certainly adds to the bottom line. But the, the, the independent film now is as good a time to be an independent filmmaker as there ever was. Because there are more distributors now, there are more ways to make money. You can stream it, you can sell it on iTunes, you can sell it, you can have it be on video on demand. I'm pointing to my television off camera. Um, you know, there are. Sure, we run stuff on Amazon. Sorry? We run stuff on Amazon quite a bit. Yeah, now. I mean, you know, TuneIn is a perfect example. You know, now streaming on Amazon Prime. You have more distributors and more distributors popping up every day because. The costs are different. People, it's all digital now. You know, when I made two Ninas, I shot it on film. I shot it on Super 16. I then blew it up to 35. And then we had to manufacture prints to, to send them around. Now, yeah. anything I've shot, the two movies I've made since, one I produced and one I directed, we shot on digital. So you don't have that cost. But you know what? You don't have to make a 35 millimeter print anymore because the thing can be sent out digitally. Right. And that's an enormous cost savings. So you get these new companies coming up and saying, look, we can spend a little bit of money to get it out in theaters and also have a video on demand and get it out there. And we're spending very little and we're doing, not doing much to publicize it. There's a huge amount of word of mouth and shit like that. And um, the opportunities for filmmakers to get their film seen are exponentially better than what they were when I made Two Ninas. The other thing that goes along with it, too, is the coverage of the film festivals. You look at a f website like IndieWire, which is 
probably the biggest and best website. You, you mentioned coverage of the, Yeah. They cover – their coverage of South by Southwest this year in Austin back in March – was wall to wall. They had they 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 highlighted dozens of movies. They had a whole piece. They wrote a piece: the ten best movies that came out of South by Southwest that need distribution, that should get des- distribution. They wrote reviews of everything. They had podcasts. They had I mean all this crazy stuff that just wasn't available. If Tunin is if we'd had that in in 90, 1999 when we did South by Southwest. Based on our audience reaction and the way people responded, we would have sold to Nina's like that. You know, it's just a different world. The internet has changed everything. Well, I just looked after we talked the last time, and uh, I saw that you can actually self-publish stuff on Amazon now, movies on Amazon now, and that like, that's crazy. Absolutely, you, you don't need a anything. distribution company yeah. at all. You just do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so Great. Uh, do you know what the percentage is that, like video on demand will bring in or selling it to oh, Netflix or something like that? You know what, let's, if we use if we use a, if we use a, a film like Obvious Child that probably did 5 million dollars, I think did about 5 million dollars with in the theatrical in box office. It probably did close to that on video on demand. So I think for a small did, movie it can double it. Double their bottom uh, line. If, more than that. I mean, uh, for, for, uh, there are movies that go directly to video on demand and make all of their money there. That's one of the business models for these horror films, lower budget horror films, because you only need a certain number of people to see the movie at home to get your money back. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I just saw with and, Amazon, too. I don't remember what the percentage was, but you got like 50 to 70% of the rental or purchase fee. Like, that's significant. Yeah. Well, I mean, it costs nothing. Amazon, nothing. Amazon is is charging you for the platform. It costs them literally sure. nothing. Right. You know, it's server space for them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's on you to get it out there and to get people to know that that that, that your film is is there. But it's like anything else. You know, it's like this guy who wrote The Martian. He self published the book. It caught. You know, it, it was something that people it, people started to read. I don't know how I, there was some. I think somebody talked about it and then it exploded. And mm-hmm. uh, and now it's a really Scott movie with Matt Damon. Yeah, I heard uh, I heard him on a podcast, and he's just absolutely crushing it ever since that thing took off. He's just the, the, the author. Ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course he is. Of course yeah, he's he just is. like a computer nerd who wrote a a really science laden book, and now he's like kicking ass. It's great. Yeah, look, the same thing happened to Tom Clancy. You know how Tom Clancy became famous? Nope. Ronald Reagan got off of Air Force, got off of, um, of uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Marine One, the helicopter, mm-hmm. and was walking across the, the lawn to the White House, and he had a copy of Hunt for Red October in his hand. Oh, interesting. Hunt for Red October was, Hunt for Red October was initially self-published, a little, no, not self-published, little tiny, I think it was the Naval Institute Press published it, because it's all technical stuff. I mean, it's a great thriller. It's a terrific book. Have you ever read it? Yes, I've read a lot of his stuff, but they're very technical. Yeah, I mean, it's very technical, and I've only read a couple of his things, but I read Hunt for Red October, but it was the Naval Institute Press. It was a few thousand copies. It was really not that big a deal, and then President Reagan, it somehow he, he heard about it, picked it up, and he was, it was, he was seen walking off Marine One, the helicopter, with a book in his hand, and sales fucking exploded. And Tom Clancy just died, I think, last year. But he was a billionaire when he died. Yeah, he's he, he lived up, in Baltimore. He had so much money, so. he owned a piece of the Orioles. Yeah, he was super freaking loaded. It was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I, you were talking about these movies that come out and they just go straight to video on demand. And actually, uh, Aaron and I have been watching a lot of small horror movies that just come out on Netflix or Amazon sure. Prime just to kind of see what's possible, what they're doing now with low-budget stuff. Most of them are complete turds, but some of them are pretty damn good. And yeah. So, like, how do the economics of that work? They just get a couple hundred thousand or a million or two million and get this movie. How do they make their money back on Netflix? Like, Netflix buys it, but they're not going to buy Netflix. it for a million dollars. Well, no, but Netflix... Buys a lot of movies that they put up there, and Netflix, you know, has a ridiculous amount of money from subscribers. Sure. So, I mean, I don't know how many of the. I mean, 
Netflix, there's a, there's a, there's a never ending desire for horror movies. To, to, I mean, to, to, I mean, look, the, the, a lot of these movies cost, they're, no, they're not costing a million dollars. They're costing 50000 They're costing $100,000, these low-budget we've, watch, we've watched some found footage ones that were like, yeah, you picked up a camcorder and <laughs> made a movie. Yeah, I mean, those, shows. those movies, some of those, those movies cost ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 because everybody's, they, 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 they edit the thing, they shoot the thing on a little camera, they edit on their laptop, they do it entirely themselves, their friends, they and their friends work essentially for free. Yep. You know, I mean, you shoot it for nothing. If you if you make this movie for ten or fifteen grand, and if you can do all that shit yourself, and you don't worry about production value or anything like that, you make this movie for five, ten, fifteen, twenty grand, and you sell it for a little bit more than that, you've made your money back. You know, right. Netflix picks up all these movies; they pay twenty five grand for one of these movies. Sure, of course, you made it for fifteen. You made you just made two thirds profit. You made one hundred and sixty seven percent profit. You know, okay, sure. I mean, look, the thing is, is that that this there, when I was when we made two Ninas, there was a, still a stigma about straight to video. Of course, didn't want to I remember on. that was a huge thing. I mean, if you just thing. popped in a video store, your movie sucked. That's what everybody and thought. That's not the case anymore. Right, video going right to video on demand, going to right, right to streaming to any of that. That stigma is gone because the situation has changed, and the business has changed. I think that that there's no, you know I mean to to make these little horror movies. Where there's, you know, you and your wife are watching these. There's a never-ending desire. There's a, there's an unquenchable thirst for these movies. And yeah, you're right. A lot of them are turds, but they still get watched. Yeah, you know, I still watched it. You know, that you still watched it. So that goes a long way. And Netflix spends twenty five grand, and they end up making their money back. I don't know how Netflix makes their money beyond the subscriber. You know. The, the I don't know. I, I have no idea. I was just curious. Um, I mean, some of these, are, yeah, they're so low budget. You can tell if they sold that thing for anything, they're probably making all their money back. But I was just curious well, if you make a horror movie for a million bucks. Well, I guess maybe you just don't go exclusive with Netflix, so you can still have it. On no, no, no. Well, here's the difference. I mean, look, the technology is completely different too. If I had had the digital technology that they have now, I could have made two Ninas for nothing. I right. Mean, I'm assuming a lot of your lot cost of was film. We spent a tremendous amount of money on film and equipment and shit. We wouldn't have had to do that. But um, the technology is such that you can shoot a movie on your phone, and people do. You know, you, know, you can I, shoot I a movie. I was going to mention it. We just watched a horror movie. It was terrible. I don't remember what it was called anymore. But it, the whole thing was shot on an iPhone. Yeah. And you know what? It didn't look that bad. I was. It looks surprised. fine. The acting. Was yeah, it looks fine. Cool. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, it didn't look bad. But but the thing is, is that they shot on the iPhone, then the guy clearly edited himself on iMovie or whatever on right. his on his laptop, and he probably made it for ten dollars. I'm not like kidding. It. Like I'm not exaggerating. Like, you could tell they didn't it. use mics. It was just the mics on the iPhone. But even then, it didn't sound yeah. awful. So I was shocked. Look, it's it's completely the, the model is different because when your expenses are so low, any money you get in is found money. It's it's all price. You're on you're in the black immediately. Sure. You know, I mean, the technology is such that you can get away with this shit in a way that you couldn't have before. My old friend Gary Winnick, who's sadly no longer with us, he founded with John Sloss, who's the big time entertainment attorney. Um, they founded Indigent, Enter Indigent Films, which was uh, independent digital entertainment. Okay. Indigent. And they shot in these little DV cameras, and these movies all look like shit. There's a, it, Gary finally, Gary had been working for years, but made his way with a movie called Tadpole with Sigourney Weaver. And Aaron Stanford, who was the lead in, 13, in 12 Monkeys on Sci-Fi, which if you haven't watched, you should. It's terrific. I've not seen um, it. Tadpole's a good movie. There were a bunch of other movies that came out of that, and I can't think of it. Oh, uh, Pieces of April with Katie Holmes was one of okay. those. Uh, and they made a bunch of movies. And you can see that the technology is such. They're all shot on digital video. They're all shot in the late 90s into the, the, the turn of the century or so. And all of them... You can tell that it's just the, the quality, visual quality is not there because the technology wasn't there. Sure. You know? Whereas now, again, you can shoot something on an iPhone and it looks better than on these high cost cameras, that, the digital cameras that they made 15 years ago. And five years from now, you know, it'll be even better. Yeah, That's just it. It's, it's, it's really interesting changed. how quickly it's changed. And I mean, they're recording yeah. them on freaking SD cards, you know? Like gigs and gigs and gigs of video on little tiny cards. It's 
and see. Yeah, and you and then you know, and and you upload on your computer. You cut the thing together. You know, it, it literally costs you nothing. So I got to get some ice in my drink. So you keep you ask a long question, which I can think about as I get ice, walk into the fridge, and then I'll answer when I come back. <laughs> okay, I'll just blather on. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you can't hear me. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, well, then before we kind of come back around to the economics of maybe us making the dark here in the future, I wanted to talk about and back. that thing with the cat, which you yeah. seemed not happy about at the end it's of amazing. our last conversation. Yeah. So what what happened? So you write this movie, and then did you direct it as well? well? You did direct well, it. Well, here's what happened. Um, I had been friends for a long time with a casting director and acting coach named Danny Super. Danny is... I gotta be careful because I don't know who's gonna listen to this and I don't want to get sued for libel or anything. <laughs> okay. Slander is spoken, libel is printed. Um, Danny is... Uh, you know what? I'm not even going to go into the personality part of it. I'm just going to say that, that that she and I had been friends for a while. She is often difficult. She was often difficult, but still we were friends. Like it was, it was everything. You know, it was, it was a. She wasn't a, one of my best friends, but we were friends, and we get together a couple times a year and have lunch or whatever and catch up with each other. And we had worked together on Knots, which was the second movie I made. And she was kind of a big part of getting that movie actually getting made. We had had another casting director, uh, a mutual friend, and we were not happy with her. And a mutual friend said, you should meet this person, Danny Super. We did. We liked her. She then kind of came in and cracked the whip on our, on our financier, and the thing moved. So uh, we, she and I were having lunch uh, November of 2010. October, November of 2010. And she was telling me about uh, one of her students who uh, was a professional fundraiser for the Democratic Party, but also an actress. And I should think about casting her in something because she could bring money to the table. So I met her. Her name is Bridget Siegel. Bridget and I met. We hit it off. Uh, we were, for a brief second, uh, not really involved, but we I toyed with the idea of dating briefly. I think we kissed once, but that Ooh, came and went. And there was nothing. There was nothing to that because it became very quickly about business. And I said, I don't want to get romantically involved with somebody I'm going to be doing business with. So she and I talked. I had co-written this other script, and she had read it and liked it, and said, if you cast me in one of these supporting roles, I can bring some money to the table. And I said, how much? And she said, I don't know, two hundred fifty or three hundred grand. Damn. Well, this other project. This other project. Um, had too many moving pieces. I had a co-writer who was being difficult at the time and I had somebody who was interested in producing it and that project went away. But then I thought, well, why don't I just write something for Bridget in which Bridget can star and we'll make it for two hundred fifty dollars or $300,000 and I'll write it and direct it and we'll do it that way. So everybody thought that was a good idea. So I came up with a concept of, I was walking down the street. I just had drinks with a friend. I was on my way somewhere else. And I said, okay, what kind of story can I tell that's self-contained? I think that we need to do it so it takes place entirely in a building. You know, we're not moving around, shooting all over the place. Uh, so make her a shut-in. Uh, it should be an edgy comedy, kind of dark comedy. Maybe she has to so, uh, solve a mystery of some kind. We can't. I can't kill a person because the cops get involved. I can't kill a dog because people hate me, but I can kill a cat. That was my thought process. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. You, you know, kill a dog, man. Good fucking luck. People but furious, but you can kill a cat, no problem. So I sat down and came up with a, I wrote about a page and a half or two page synopsis of this general idea and showed it to Bridget and she flipped out and said, that's great. So then over Thanksgiving week, I then sat down and wrote the script. Having no idea where I was going or how I was going to do it. It was the first time that ever happened. I banged it out in about six days. Damn. And interestingly, the script didn't change much from when we shot it a year and a half later. I mean, I made some changes, but it was really, it was a polished first draft or maybe a tweaked second draft that we shot. So you were just in the zone for about six days. Sorry? You were just in the zone for about six days and just crushed it. Yeah, I would write myself into a corner and say, okay, I don't really know where to go from here. 
and then I would set it aside and I sometimes that was at night sometimes it was two o'clock in the afternoon and I'd wake up the next day and figure out how to pick it up from where I had left off and uh, so Bridget loved it Danny was Danny thought it was great uh, and I brought in a friend of mine who's a producer a guy named Mitch Goldman and the four of us were then gonna go make the movie Danny hated Mitch from the get-go and Danny is somebody who Danny know before when I said I know what I don't know Danny knows everything there ever was about everything there ever was she knows your job better than you do sure I know and people in fact at one <laughs> point like said that. to our lawyer she, at one point said to our lawyer told him how to do a certain thing and he said you know Danny I've been doing this for a long time I'm, I'm actually quite skilled you hired me for a reason I'll handle it <laughs> um, Danny eventually chased Mitch out of the project and became a full producer herself, at which point she became my biggest problem. My, she knew everything about everything. She knew how to handle, do, do stuff. At one point she said, you need to kind of take control here because you've done this before. I have a job and a, and a husband and a child, a young child, and uh, Bridget has never done this before. So you're the captain. You have to make the decision. So what would happen then is I would make a decision and I would say, okay, I decide this. And she would say, I disagree with that decision. Like everything she could do to undermine me, she did. Now, in retrospect, I think that she was either not smart enough or didn't have enough integrity to recognize that Bridget was not capable of carrying the movie. Okay. Bridget's not a strong enough actress to carry the movie. She should have played one of the supporting parts, but she lied to me and lied to Bridget and said that she was capable of doing this. I said, can she do this? And Brit Danny said, yes, that was not true. I convinced myself, I talked myself into believing that Bridget was up to the, 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 the case, up to the, up to the, 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 the job. But ultimately, as I'm sitting in my sitting editing the film, I'm looking at it and saying, ah, you know, she's not great, but she's okay. But then I showed it to some people, and they said, your movie's really good, except for the fact that your elite actress is terrible. <laughs> um, That's harsh. So, yeah, it was really it was very difficult. And Danny, Danny would would call me out in front of other people. She would do everything she could to embarrass me and make make me look bad, which I became convinced was after the fact. I said. You know what? It finally makes sense to me. Like I didn't understand why this woman, who had been my friend and who had helped to, to who had introduced us, you know, would be so horrible and so destructive and and undermining. And I think it was because she recognized that Bridget wasn't up to caliber, the caliber that was needed, and she knew this thing was going to go south. So she thought that by blaming me, I would be the scapegoat and she would get away scot free. I truly believe that. It's a okay. little bit of conspiracy theory to it, but I've talked to a couple people who are involved, and they have said, you know, that actually does, does start to make some sense. Like that, that, that isn't as far fetched as you would think. And um, the other thing too is, you know, she had Bridget convinced that she was handling all of this stuff, but Danny didn't raise any money, didn't find any locations, didn't hire anyone, didn't fire anyone. In fact. The one person she did hire, she then had us fire the next day. Bridget and I made us do it because she changed her mind about about somebody. So you said she was a full um, producer, but what exactly did she do? She didn't do anything. That's the problem. So all she did was introduce me to Bridget. And at one point, Bridget made a comment of, Danny's the one who put this whole thing together. I put the whole thing together. I hired everybody. Bridget hired, raised most of the money. I brought in a little bit of money myself at the end, which I still regret, but I was kind of painted in the corner because I, I kept thinking, talking to myself, I, was delu I deluded myself into thinking that we still had a chance to sell this movie. We didn't. And I'm actually going to, re at some point, repay the people who gave me the little bit of money that I brought to the film. But Danny, all Danny did was second guess was undermine, was tell Bridget, it was poison my relationship with Bridget. She didn't do anything that a producer does. Bridget raised most, almost all of the money and I put everything else together. I found locations, well there were two locations, Bridget found one and I found the other. There were, everybody who was hired, every single person on this crew who was hired came from me. People I hired who then hired other people. It was all directly from that. 
Which Danny, for people who don't Danny, know is not really the director's job. It's the producer's job. Right. And I'm a producer on the film. But I kept, and I also, after things had gone bad, I kept trying to bend over backwards to work with them. But it was one of those things where give an inch and they take a yard, you know? And it just got worse and worse and worse. And it was literally, the 2012 was the worst year of my entire life. Certainly so my this adult thing, life. This thing just spiraled from, almost from the start. And then you get to the point where you finish the film and that's when you tried to get your name taken off because you were so unhappy with it? I, well, what happened was there is a little bit of voiceover needed because it's internal monologue for the character. And Bridget, and I had final cut, but Bridget said, I'm not going to record the stuff that Neil wants. And it doesn't, the movie doesn't need an overall voiceover, but Danny decided it's not moving fast enough because she's not smart enough to recognize this. She said, now I'm in trouble. I mean, I'm saying it now, so fuck. It. But um, <laughs> she just didn't recognize. She, they, she had no concept of trusting your audience to understand and be able to follow this. Like when I showed, I had a test screening. The film, final version of the movie is 77 or 78 minutes. I showed a version that was 82 or 83 minutes to about 20 or about two dozen people that I knew, but all, I, all of whom I trusted to tell me the truth. And they came back with, the thing moves generally pretty well. Uh, you've got a great performances from the supporting people. It's well written. It's well paced. The whole thing. I like the quiet moments. It's a shame your lead actress can't act. Literally, that's what it came. That's what came back. So, um, Danny, when she saw when she saw a rough cut, said it needs a voiceover. It needs a voiceover. So Bridget decided on her own, without talking to me, decided to write a voiceover, which she then recorded without my knowledge and put on the film. And the problem is Bridget How is that even possible? Bridget like, fancies herself. Well, here's the thing is that the guy who was supposed to be our go between never said to them, this is unprofessional. This is wrong. You are not, this is not the way to do things. You are doing this. This is a, this is, you know, cause he was, he is another guy who has no integrity. Uh, you said you had a go between. Is that because things had been going so poorly? You kind of had some things had gone so you. poorly that we weren't communicating in person. We were not communicating directly. We had to have a go between. And I kept saying, "Okay, well, let's try this and let's try this," and they were just weren't having it. And at one point, he said to me, "Our go between said they want you on your knees," and I said, "I don't understand why. I haven't done anything. It's not like I'm trying to rape or kill or steal kill somebody or steal anything. I'm just trying to make a movie, and I don't understand why." Things got, I mean, things got very, very personal, not from me, but for them. I mean, again, the fact that you actually want, you make the comment, I want him on his knees, <laughs> tells crazy. you how petty, how petty and ridiculous this became. You know, I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to talk about because there's so much involved. Uh, I could probably write a book about it, about this horrible, horrifying experience. But anyway, Bridget recorded this thing. And Bridget, because of her contacts, because of the stuff that she'd done before, got a book deal and wrote a novel about um, about a congressional aide or something who ends up having an affair with a congressman because she lived in that world. I never read it, but it got horrible reviews and, and it, the book didn't do well. But because of that, she fancied herself a writer. And so she wrote this voiceover, this narration that doesn't make any sense at all. It makes zero sense. What she talks about in the narration doesn't match the stuff that she's doing as an actress on camera. Huh. So we got into it and I said, look, I'm willing to work with you to write something that actually makes sense. And they weren't willing to do that. So I finally said, okay, well, I'm just gonna take my name off it. Return my, my, my investors money because you are violating. And you're, I, I, they, I didn't have, the financial wherewithal to actually go after them legally because they were violating our agreement and taking final cut away from me illegally. Having said that, in retrospect, what I should have done was say, you know what, go ahead and sue me because I'm not going to do the things you want to do. Go ahead and sue me because then you will never sell this movie. Because once there's the taint of legal action between the filmmakers, nobody's ever going to fucking touch this movie. In retrospect, that's what I should have done. But I was so overwhelmed with this negativity. I was broke. 
I was trying to make this movie. I had painted myself into a corner, which I won't ever do again. Like I made the movie specifically, like I saw the warning signs a mile away and I chose to ignore them. I said, no, it'll get okay. It'll be okay. It'll get better. But I need to make this movie. I need to make this movie. I had convinced myself of that and that was the biggest problem. And when Danny started throwing her weight around, even though she didn't know anything, I kept trying to make her happy because I thought that that would keep things smooth between us all. And what it did was it ultimately poisoned Bridget against me because she saw me as a pushover and every, because I wasn't fighting back as much. Danny was every, Danny was the only one talking. I had at one point said to Bridget, you will never hear me bad mouth Danny. I know Danny sometimes says shit about me, but you won't ever hear me bad mouth her. And I foolishly stuck to that because I wanted to keep my hands clean. What I should have done was stand up and say, you know what? You don't know anything about anything. And I don't understand why you are talking like this because you don't know what you're talking about. And I let her get away with stuff that I shouldn't have. So a lot of it is my own fault. So what is the but aftermath of this? What? What is the aftermath of this? What happened to the movie? Did it ever get any well, kind of they, release? They, no, no, no. They got into a couple of little tiny rinky-dink film festivals. Um, I was basically told, if you take your name off the movie, we will sue you. Okay. And so I you're said, attached okay. to it. Well, but, but here's what I said. I said, okay. I said, okay, well, Bridget is going to record the stuff that I need for my version of the film. Also, at the very end of the movie, after it fades to black, the first credit that's going to come up is Gretchen. Gretchen is the character. Gretchen's narration written by Bridget Siegel. I, and, and they took that as a compliment because that's how dumb they are. When all I was trying to do was distance myself from this horrifying thing that they had written, that, that, that she had written. I don't want people to think that I wrote that. That's horrible. So, and Danny then said, well, no, no. If she gets the writing credit, she gets it up front in the opening credits. And that's when I said, and that was, it, it was one of those things that happened so late in the game. And I said, oh, Christ. And I said, no. And it's ridiculous. And I'm not going to allow you to do it. You're taking something that I'm giving you and trying to, you know, turn into something else and they backed right down from that which I thought was you know and, and at the time I was just so exhausted that I just said oh of course you know if I'd done this before I feel like a lot of this wouldn't have happened uh but we, we got they, they got they we not we they got into a couple of rinky dink little film festivals nobody's ever gonna buy that movie it's a piece of shit okay so you got now, an actress you got a well written well the thing is is that with if without the voiceover without this stupid narration the movie actually makes sense but her narration plus her performance, nobody's ever going to buy that movie. So they didn't even put it up anywhere themselves. It's just sitting there, nothing happening. Can't see it anywhere. As far as I know. And they have, a, they have a contractual and financial obligation to let me know if they sell it. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and I made it very clear to the go-between. I said, look, he was giving me updates saying, hey, we got into this festival. Congratulations. I'm like, what the fuck are you congratulating me for? It's not my movie. Yes, it is. You directed it. But it's not my film. It's not, you know, I never once referred to it as my movie. I referred to it as our movie. Um, but then it wasn't mine at all. It's their movie. And so I finally said to the guy, look, the only way I ever want to hear about this again, and I want to make this very clear, is in the unlikely is when the, the, the New York State tax refunds come, and that goes back to my investors, and in the unlikely event that this movie ever sells. At that point, you can tell me. I don't want to hear about any other film festivals. If it wins any awards, I'm not going to accept them. I don't want any anything to do with this in any way, shape, or form other than financially because I owe my investors the money that they put into this. So that's the agreement that we have. So, so what happened to the other players? Are they still in the business, or did this experience just – they're done? She's not I acting. No, the other woman's not producing. I have no idea. I have no idea. I know that she is – this is doing going to do exactly nothing for her career. The and actress? For Bridget, yeah. Okay. It's going to do nothing for her career because nobody's ever going to see it. And she's not good at it. And she sabotages her own performance with this ridiculous narration. Danny has built a career as an acting coach. Does not do a lot of casting. And, you know, I mean, to her credit, the cast we have for this movie is actually pretty good. And the actors are great. And everybody who's not named Bridget Siegel is great in the movie. You know, people who have seen it. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> <laughs> Look, the fact, and it's not just me saying this. Like, I actually talked myself into believing that Bridget wasn't bad, but even our go-between said, "You know, Bridget's not very good." 
you know, the guy who sure. was the go-between, who chose them over me, who pretended to be Switzerland and actually was not, um, he said to me, you know, Bridget's not really that good an actress. So, you know, when he's saying it, and he's a lap dog for these two. Hmm. What does that that's, tell you? Uh, that's rough, man. So did that... It was awful. Make, it was awful. It, 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 almost, it, almost turned me, well, it, it almost turned me off of directing entirely. Like, there was a stretch of time after that where I said, you know what, I'm just never going to direct the movie again. I'm just going to keep writing. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Know. Did it really push you away from wanting to do some of this stuff? Yeah, I get over that because I got back into the stuff, my own stuff, and said, you know what, I'm going to... When I do this the next time, I'm going to work with professionals who know what they're doing, so I won't have this experience again. Like, I had a difficult experience with two Ninas with my producers, but... I'm f now friends with them years later, and I have made peace with them because we were very young. Greg was 24, Denise was 25, I was 26 when we made that movie. We were all first timers, we all had egos, we all thought that we knew what was best for the film. And I truly believe, and I've said this to them, both Greg and Denise, that every argument we had, I believe that in retrospect, the person who was arguing for one thing or another had what they thought was the best interest of the movie at heart. I don't believe this to be true with that thing with the cat. I because think that this was, it was personal, a power not play. business. I think it was a personal power play thing. I think it was a it was a it was a lot of bullshit that had no place in the creative process. I truly believe that. I think that that if if there was a creative bone in that woman's body, we would not have ended up either of them. We would not have ended up where we ended up. It's a, but I'm past it's a crazy now. Story. Like I'm, getting, I'm getting rid. I'm sorry. That's a crazy story. It's yeah, it is, and it's unfortunate, and it's heartbreaking because it didn't have to be this way. You know, it was a good script. We could have done something interesting and fun with it, and it was sabotaged. You know, but I'm over that. Look, I would direct the dark if we got that going. If we made it for the right budget and somebody let me do it, I would direct the dark in a heartbeat. I would direct. I'm gonna. I'm planning to direct this movie, Rocket Surgery, the romantic comedy hopefully later this year. I mean, I, I want to get back behind the camera and direct again. And, okay. you know, because I get over it. Look, time passes and wounds heal and you get over it and you say, you know what? Okay, if I don't learn something from this, then it's a worthless experience. And I certainly learned plenty from it. Well, that's a, that's a good last transition for a little final couple comments here. What You were talking about how different things are now. So as we talked about before, you've – written the screenplay for the dark. You're now shopping it around looking for investors or whatever. What exactly is the process for that? Because most really. what's that? Looking for buyers rather than investors. Because I'm done. Okay. My days my days of going out and banging the door and having people write checks for this much or that much to put it together are over. So it's for people who have no idea how any of this works. So okay, I, I can talk about the first part. I wrote a novel you contacted me saying you wanted a horror movie to adapt. I sent you the dark. Right. You wrote the script. We came up with an agreement. Now, what are you doing now to try and move that forward to get this made? I am showing it to people I know who make horror movies or who know people who make horror movies or are getting us in or, or are interested in, you know, in the, in the genre. So what's happening is um, a few people have read it. They really like it. And uh, it's either... One friend of mine who's making films, he said, I love it, but I have a pro the reason, the only reason I'm going to pass is because two f projects that I've been developing for a while are now going, gonna, they're going to go back to back. So if I make this, it's not going to happen for a year and a half. Sure. And I don't really think that that's good for either one of us. He said, but it's terrific. And I will think if there's anybody in our, anybody else who's doing what I'm doing, because I will happily pass it along. And there's no stigma attached because I'm not going to them and saying, I passed on this. It was, I love this. I can't do it but you should take a look at it. Um, one of these people, you know, before we started, you know, just as we both started talking before we actually went live, I mentioned a very good old friend of mine used to be in the film finance business and he used to do horror films. And he now has some contacts in that world. And these guys, several people who want to, who are in the horror world who want to make, start making films and do them for under $2 million dollars these movies. So Which he read the dark the could be done for it. easily. The dark could be done easily. for easily. Yeah. The only issue with the dark is there's a little bit of visual effect stuff. Right. And I honestly don't know how much that costs and I need to talk to somebody who knows. But that kind of thing these days shouldn't be terribly expensive. I think we could probably make the dark for a million dollars or less. 
Sure, and even less, the creepiest and part is everything is really dark, and then the people you do see are acting weird. You know, that's not any crazy well, visual effect. Well, actually, but there are some things. Like when Walter No, there are, but the, I'm saying what makes that is the dark. It's not crazy right. monsters or anything like that. Well, there's a mon there there are a couple of demon shots. There is a there's a uh, there's some stuff with faces. There's little things. There's when the when the sun rises and the, the the dark spirals back. Like there are effects to it. I don't know how much that stuff costs, but other people do. But the point is, you can make this movie relatively cheaply. And what would happen is because again, there is such a thirst for. I mean, the, People who are breaking into the film finance business often start with horror because it's such an easy sell, because there's a built-in audience. Genre films sell easy, more easily. Sure. And it's an inter international thing, especially with this. Everyone's afraid of the dark. Right. That's why I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, that's a great tagline, too. Don't turn out the light. Boom. Done. Um, sure. So what happens is somebody will say, okay, this is great. We want to make it. We're going to buy the script. And then they have the wherewithal. To, it's, it's either either they have financing in place or they go out then and raise the money to do it. But okay. because it's such a low cost and a simpler return, you know, there's, as you say, you and, and Aaron watch these movies on Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, these little horror movies, because you like watching horror movies. So there's the built-in audience. There are a million, five million, ten million people just like you across the country, across the world, who do the exact same thing. Right. So you can get one with a little bit of heft behind it and maybe somebody who there's a couple of recognizable names, that ups the ante even more. So let's say one of these companies buys it. They find it. Did that answer it. your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm trying to walk it through because the movie sure. industry, people just show up and watch it. They really don't understand everything that goes into it. So let's say uh, you there find someone who wants it. Jason, there are people in the industry who don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> let's say one of these companies buys it. They have financing for it. What What are the next steps for them? I mean, does it take a year for them to start shooting? Does it take five years? You know, depends. I, depends. I mean, I think if they have financing ready to go, it's something that is probably they get it and they say, okay, um, they will end up probably having notes. They'll have, there'll be rewrites. It depends on what their schedule is. If they say, we have a slot, we want to shoot this movie over the course of uh, six weeks in January in Louisiana next year. Okay, well, then that's when it goes. Um, and if, it, if, if the, the creative person behind it, and I'm just using a generic project here, not necessarily this one, a generic project, you know, if they're not able to, if the filmmaker is not able to execute what the production company wants, then it'll either get pushed or dropped or whatever. But let's assume that everything gets taken care of properly. You know, it comes together. It could take, I mean, I, a project's not going to take five years to go or even a year to go if the financing is there. If they have to go out and find financing, that's the question. But so let's that's assume the that's the struggle. If you end up with a with a production company that has its own financing and can go, like let's say Jason Blum, let's say Blumhouse, they have their own money. They don't have to sure. go out and raise money. Um, and the production company that is making most of the horror that gets released in theaters and is good. A lot of it, sure. But, you know, uh, there's, uh, let's see, Joel Silver's company, um, Dark Castle, I don't know if it's still around, but I mean, throwing around there, there are companies that have financing that are making these films. On that level, it'll go whenever they're ready for it to go. It's a question of do they need to finance or not. If it's already financed, then it can. Then it's really about what they, when they want to shoot and where. Okay. You know, do they want to shoot Louisiana in January? Do they want to shoot Louisiana? Do they want to shoot Michigan? Do they want to shoot, you know, somewhere where, someplace where, the tax credits and the governmental regulations are favorable to them. Right. You know, then sure. it's okay. What Which spot do we place? I'm Which sorry? is not California. <laughs> it's so not friendly right. to shooting. Which right. Is hilarious. Right. You know, I mean, Massachusetts, Michigan, Louisiana, those are the big three. Now I think New York is still pretty good. Minnesota is trying to do better. There are other places that are actually trying to draw. Uh, Vancouver's huge. A, obviously. They've been shooting a lot in Pittsburgh. 
like the Dark Knight movies and on in Pittsburgh. Yeah, they've been shooting a lot of stuff in Pittsburgh. Um, so you as so you have the option for the dark, which for people means you exclusively get to shop it around or whatever the hell you want to do. Well, I have the option to. I'm the only one currently who's allowed to write a, a screenplay based on the material. Right. Okay. Now you're going to try to sell it. Right. But for you. What are you looking for your involvement to be? So you wrote the script. You're looking to sell it. What would your end? What, what do you want to get out of it beyond selling it? Do you want to still be a part of the production? Do you still want to like you mentioned maybe directing? What's your it end goal? Entirely. It depends entirely on the size of the scope, the size and scope of the thing. If a company like say Sony Screen Gems, and I use them just because a they make horror movies on on a larger scale, and b a friend of mine who works there is the one who said to me in October, write a horror movie. And then I called you. Right. So hypothetically, like I don't expect, like he has the script. He'll read it when he gets to it. It's, it's on a pile. Even though we're friends, he's taking his time reading it. But hypothetically, let's say he, he reads it and likes it and says, I want to make this movie. That budget becomes probably somewhere between five and 10 or maybe $12 million to make that film. That's Which not a movie a that horror. they're going to let Sorry, which is That's a bigger, bigger horror, horror movie. movie. Yeah. Right. At that point, I'm not at the place in my career where they're going to hire me to direct that film. Sure. Okay. They're going to bring in somebody who has made other horror movies or is a commercial director or somebody that has a visual scope of things and is going to come in and they're going to say, okay, here's $10 million, go make this movie. In what which would case, you want your, what would you want your role to be if that happened? Well, that's what I was, where I was about to go. What, in okay. that case, my role would be I might get some kind of co-producer or executive producer credit, but, ideal, but ultimately my, my role is going to be the check they paid me to write the, to, as, as, as screenplay by Neil Turrets, based gotcha. on the novel by Jason Brandt. Gotcha. You get a check, okay. I get a check, we win, we've sold something, your book has been turned, is going to be turned into a movie, going to help your sales, your name's going to get out there, both of us win. I will have just sold a film to Sony Screen Gems, which means that my name goes, so that for me and for us, that becomes the sale is the reward. Sure. And then I would have probably little to nothing to do with the film itself. Now, if we end up with a smaller production company who's going to make it for 750000 or a million or a million and a half, that's a movie that I can go and say, look, on this scale, there's no reason for me not to direct this film. In which case, my involvement becomes central. Sure. If they came and said, look, we, do, we have somebody we want to work with. We're going to make this movie for a million and a half dollars. We have a guy who we love. We've been looking for a project for him to direct because he made this little $200,000 horror movie. And now we want to give him more money to do it. I would say, great, make me a producer. And we're done. Gotcha. Movie's getting made. Everybody's happy. My involvement can be as much or as little as they want it to be, but I get a writer and a, some kind of producer credit on the film, and gotcha. that become that becomes important career-wise. You know, uh, so that's really the extent of those are the two extreme. Like those are the two realistic possibilities of how this thing could move forward. You sell it. You wash your hands, or you are completely involved till it comes out, or Third option being company says, we want to make this. We want to make it for about a million and a half. I say, I want to direct it. They say, well, we have this guy. We've been looking for a project for him to direct. We want him to direct it, but we'll give you a producer credit, which I will either sure. then be on set as a producer or I get the credit and say, okay, just send me the checks. So there are three possibilities. The third one is the least likely. Sure. Okay. But it is a possibility. Like those are the three. That's, those are options A, B, and C. Well, I do want to say, uh, I like, I, I got this approach, I don't remember who the writer was, but he's just said, you know what, when I sell the rights to one of my books to be a movie, I don't give a shit what they do, as long as the check clears, that's their thing, and I, I was reading it, and I thought, you know what, that is me exactly, and then I don't have to worry about anything. Okay, you do your thing, well, whatever like, happens, happens. I feel like Stephen King has said that. It might have been because he's got some really bad movies are, based on his stuff. There are there are a lot of there are a lot of authors who have that attitude. And I really think it's the way to go. I really do. Because what the fuck I do I know about making a movie? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's 
you wrote me a check. The check cleared. My bank account went. The balance went up. Great. You know, yeah. everybody wins. Fantastic. Yeah, I, you know, I just think I firmly that, believe in that. Look, I just think that. that and I, a lot of I talked to a lot of authors who do not think this way at all. They think this is their baby still, and I'm like, no, no, no. You don't know shit about making movies. You know nothing sure. about making movies. You're selling it to people who know how to make movies. Maybe it doesn't work, but you got to let go of that and just let them do their thing. And you just if it's if it's a great movie, that's awesome. If it's not, you didn't do it. Yeah. Well, that's a that's an evolved perspective, and I think that a lot of people aren't able to have that. But I also think that. It's just a smart way to be because it's 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 an enormous amount of – it'll cause you so much stress and angst otherwise. You know, there's this book – there was a movie that came out um, with Simon Pegg and Kirsten Dunst a few years ago called uh, How to Lose Friends and, Influ and, and Alienate People. Yeah, that was based on a book, wasn't it? And it, it's based on a book, and I had met the author once many years ago and was actually at an event where he was thrown out and is mentioned in the book – and I read the book and said, and I was there. I remember him getting thrown out. And I said, I wrote him, when I read the book, I said, hey, by the way, you have the location wrong. You have it here. It actually happened here. I know I was there. And he said, he wrote me back and said, thank you. I was drunk, but I will, in the next edition, I'll make sure that's corrected. Um, but he actually wrote Toby something. I can't remember his last name. But he wrote this thing where he was on set during the shooting of the movie and he found that he was just constantly getting upset about the liberties they were taking from his book. So he wrote an email to the director and said, I feel like every time I'm on set, I'm not welcome. You're doing something that I didn't, wouldn't necessarily want with my book, and I don't really know how to proceed. And the author has had a six-word response. Very easy fix to this. Very easy fix to this. Five words, which was... Don't come back. You know, it right. was very easy fix to the, for this. And that was it. And Toby got it and said, you know what? You're right. And he never came, went back to set. And he kind of, the movie came out and it bombed. It's not a good movie. But it was like, why put yourself through that? You know, the first thing you said to me, and I think we talked about this last time, was I said, I will try to be as true to the book as I can be. And you said, you know what? Don't even worry about it. Do your thing. It's yours now. Just write something good. And I said, well, that, you know, that's what I will do. And to your credit, I added a, a, a couple of huge things that weren't in the book. And you came back with, wow, this is great. You know, I was hoping for, you know, you were just pleased that I'd use as much as your, of, your di of your dialogue as I did, um, which was, you know, which is the response you want from an author who says, look, this is great. I told you do your thing and you did. And I love the final product and I hope it goes because then we both make money. Hooray. You know, I mean, I think that most people aren't evolved or self-confident enough to do that. I think that, the, as you say, you talk to authors who say, oh, it's my baby and I want control. You know what? Fuck you. You know? Yeah. Then go no, right that's crazy. Brain. My baby's on the yourself. shelf. My baby's on the shelf. Yeah. I wrote it. It's out. That's it. You're not fucking with my book. You know, you're trying to make a movie. That's – and like I said, it's just a huge thing of um, control. You're exactly right. It's uh, – people are not able to let go of things sometimes. It's like – what, were you going to tell them how to make a movie? How many have you made? What the fuck do you know about anything? You know, like you wrote a 500-page novel. They're trying to make a 90-minute movie. That's a different I think, format. I think that that goes across. Okay, well, there are two things I have to say to that. One, people in general have a hard time letting things go, especially creative people, because they feel like Absolutely. I spent so much blood, so much of my time and so much of my blood, sweat, and tears on this if there's going to be some kind of adaptation or translation of it into another medium, they should do it justice. Well, yes and no. The truth is, is that your medium is this. I said last time, I'm not a good novelist. I tried. I would like to try again, but I don't see that ending well for me. I really don't. Like, I would love to end up writing the great American novel. I don't, the only way I can see that happening is 15, 20 years, 30 years down the road where I'm older and I have the time to sit down and say, you know what? Fuck it. I don't want to write anything. I'm done directing movies. I'm 75 years old. I'm going to sit down and write a novel and spend a year or something just cranking that out. But before then, what's the point? I'm good at this. I want to do this. This is how I can tell stories. And I think that everybody has their 
way to do that, but can't necessarily recognize that their medium isn't necessarily something they're able to translate into other mediums. I can't write poetry. I can't paint. I can't play a note of music. I can do this. And I think that I, again, I know what I don't know. I know what I can't do. And a lot of people who, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the world's most secure guy. I'm an erotic Jewish writer, for Christ's sakes. But I think that a lot of people who are authors don't have the self-awareness to be able to say, and this isn't just authors, this is screenwriters who want to be novelists. This is it's actors who want to write. People. This is, it's creative people who want to cross over somehow. It's, it's actors who want to write or direct. It's whatever, you know? And I think that um, authors especially – it's because it's so public that they write something and it's tr take somebody else takes it and translate it into something else. They're the most public about it, but they're also, they've been sitting in their little cave and writing this thing. And now all of a sudden it's somebody else. It's, it, it's somebody else takes it and tries to run with it. And it's out of their control. As you said, you know, it's that, that thing where my baby is on the shelf. That's my, I did my job. Now, if you want to turn to something else, great, do it. You're, I think, the, I feel like you're the minority. I think that authors who recognize that and are able for to- For sure, the, the minority, minority, for sure. Yeah. yeah, so. Anyway, man, we've run long already. We're at almost an hour and 15 minutes, I think, so. Good times, dude. I appreciate all the info. That was interesting. Was there anything that, that you wanted to ask that you didn't get a chance to? Did I prattle on too much about anything that we cut no, us? I don't think so. We kind of got to everything. I was just curious about the little bit of the movie making process and uh, what had happened with your last one because you did not seem happy when you mentioned it uh, yeah. two weeks ago. So, well, no, I, and, now you have, you had, and you have a very sliver of information about why, of an insight as to why. I mean, it was, it's, 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 I, I, I probably could write a whole book about it. I probably could write a, a, like three, 400 pages about it. Maybe you should. Um, and maybe some might be cathartic. Down the road, I will. Yeah, it might be cathartic. You know, you know, at this point, I don't know how much catharsis I need. I, I still kind of, you know, I can talk about it without losing my temper. You know, I can get aggravated, certainly. Um, but it's not, it doesn't have the same hold on me it did. You could call the book I'm That really Fucking Thing with the Cat. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Uh, you know what's funny is last night, <clears throat> we'll just, I know, I know you want to wrap up, but one last thing is last night I was, I was out. Memorial Day, I went over to uh, a buddy of mine is a bartender, and, and, and he's about 60 now. He used to write, and then he stopped. His kids are out of the house now, and so I had told him, when your, last, when your second kid goes to college, it's time to start writing again. So he wrote a play, and he asked me to read it and to critique it and the whole thing. So I went over there to pick it up because I asked him. He said, I'm going to print it out, and I'll email it to you. So we were over there, and we were talking about stuff, and um, just sitting there, it was a quiet night. And he brought up that thing with a cat because he was one of the people who was at that test screening. Okay. <clears throat> and he suggested the concept of buying the rights back from the other, from the two women and making the movie with a woman who could actually act. And I said, you know what? I don't have any interest in that purely because I don't need to tell that story again, regardless of how well or poorly it was told. I have other stories I want to tell, and I don't need to revisit an old story right. and do that again and feel like I need to do it better than I did. I feel like there's more important things that I've written that I will write that are more important stories to tell, not for just for me, but for an audience. So I feel like I'm the, the further along I get, it's three years ago uh, next week. Three years ago, next week, we shot. We started shooting the movie. We shot it in June of 2012. So I'm now three years out from shooting that film. And the further out I get, the more at ease I am with it and more I can talk about it. Like, I, two years ago, I couldn't talk about it without starting to yell. Jesus. Well, like, how really, long did you put into it? How much time did you put in to have it end up the way it did for you? Uh, too much. Too much. Because again, you know, this pre-production, there is the build-up to it. There's, there's, there's dealing with people. There's hiring people. There's all this stuff, and then there's the editing process and post-production, and that's a whole other nightmare. And dealing with people who don't know what they're doing, it's just, you know, it was hours and hours and hours. It was thousands of hours of, 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 of time ill spent. That's a long time. Um, that's a lot of time to look back and be like, 
God damn it. <laughs> well, again, it was the entire year. I mean, the entire calendar year of 2012 was a miserable fucking year. It was just awful. And I look back on it and say, okay, as an adult, I have the worst year of my adult life. Like, I had some rough years when I was a teenager, but as an adult, like from 18 on, 1994 wasn't great, but 2012 beat it because I should have known better. That's the thing is that ultimately as bad as these two were and as bad as the experience was, it was my own fault. Like I should, I, I saw the warning says I should have been able to deal with things better than I did. And that's a lesson that you learn, you know, I mean, I, I'm much better equipped to deal with things moving forward because of it, you know, sure. no, no, no experience, should, no negative experience should be purely negative because if you can take something out of it, then it can, you can turn it into a positive experience. And I feel strongly that there were positive things that came out of, the 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 catastrophe the cry the the train wreck that was that thing with the cat. <laughs> sure, you no, know that that does make sense. That makes you can sense. do that. And you know what? Then you, then you know. I feel like it's it's. I've grown as a person and being able to now that I'm in my mid forties, be able to look at that and say, all right, you know what? I can move forward with this and 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 not completely lose my fucking mind every time I bring it up in conversation. Well, let's um. Let's wrap this up here, but I'm thinking uh, as we get some movement on the dark, either from a buyer or what, whichever buyer we're looking at, um, you've, you've got a lot of uh, irons in the fire. Uh, might be an interesting I'm thing to come back. That before the end of the year we have somebody who, I'm hoping that before the end of the year somebody comes in and says, okay, I want to make this movie. I feel strongly that we should be able to make that happen. Okay, so that would be a cool thing to do is to just talk about how everything's going, what's happening with it, what the next steps sure. are. Like That would be cool, for I think, for some people to hear. So. Let's plan on that. Well, listen, just so we're clear, just so we're clear, like as big an asshole as you are, I enjoy these conversations. So anytime you want me to come back, I'll come back. All right. Well, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> oh, funny <I'm> bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you could tell it wasn't that bad because I drank it. So look at that. So yeah, you uh, cool thing. yeah good for you. Yeah. yeah. So looking forward to doing it again. Suck a dick. I'll catch you later. Yeah, me too.